And um, <clears throat> I guess we'll just take a quick look in Revelation 12. <clears throat> we want to talk about the nature of the conflict. Lindsay Lou. <clears throat> the nature of the conflict. Okay, well, the nature of the conflict is written on the board. Lambs and beasts. That's, that explains the conflict right there. <clears throat> okay, and so um, it has to do with crucifiers and the crucified. <clears throat> it has to do with those who live by the sword and those who die by their sword that they're living by. It has to do with the spirit of the lamb as opposed to the spirit of this world. And the law <clears throat> falls under that category because grace doesn't. Grace would, I'm just going to use this as an example. This is a pitiful one. But grace would let you up when the law would condemn you. Okay. Um, the law is an enforcer. The law brings judgment. The law is meant <clears throat> to... Uh, punish to um, uh, exact revenge, um, so many things. Uh, I was talking with uh, someone recently, and I, I'm not picking on the Catholic Church, I'm just, this just came to my mind, and I thought, <clears throat> how horrible is it that if you, if someone doesn't agree with you, agree with your doctrine, agree with your teaching and stuff, that you call them a heretic and you burn them at the stake. You burn a human being alive because they're wrong and you're right. And, you know, I, when I was in the Army, I was a medic and for part of the time I was in Fort Sam Houston Hospital, <clears throat> and I worked with the burn victims from Vietnam who had been, you know, they used those flamethrowers and stuff, and, and it was horrible. They were, they were all wrapped up, but you, they would take them off and have to change the bandages, and they would never show them what they looked like um, because it would be too traumatic right off. But they, they didn't look human, and that's a fact. You can't imagine. You cannot imagine. And um, I mean, just seeing it's traumatic, much less having that happen to you, much less being burned at the stake, only to have them years later, those who did that to you, only to have them years, years later canonize you as a saint, which you probably were. I mean, there are, there are those who were burned at the stake who like like Stephen, you know, he's being stoned and he's looking up at the Lord. He's not looking at the stones and he's, his face is shining like an angel. There, so what is my point? My point is there are lambs and beasts. There are, there are those who exact horrible revenge or horrible punishment because you're not lined up. Uh, the way we think you should be. And in that case, they're saying with God. And so we're going to burn you at the stake because you're not lined up with God. Um, and again, m just a huge amount of those people, not just those burned at the stake, but beheaded and whatever else, <clears throat> they canonized later as saints and, are, and they're now some of the top people that even the Catholics honor the top people. Well, they're honored because they wouldn't recant. They wouldn't go against what they knew to be the Lord. And, and they would lay down their life. And maybe in some of those cases, maybe in all of them, because of the effect that's, that's been had, they laid down their life as lambs the, by the nature of Christ. And something came of it. Lives were touched. So. The nature of the conflict is that 
which uh, in, in case of a beast, and, and when you attach that to law, says, um, you know, you're wrong. Um, I, I, before I say all that, I was, I was thinking about these things in relationship with Jesus. I was thinking if, if we were there with Jesus during the trial and everything, would we have said, would we have heard what people said, and would we have made judgment based on the, the normal line that people followed that the Pharisees set up, <clears throat> and the things that we heard that they brought false witnesses and said this, would we, would we even be able to discern a lamb if we ever ran into it? Christ in anybody or there would we would we or would we join the crowd and go well this is you know this is wrong that's just all there is to it hang him up on a cross but then I thought about it from another angle and as you can see I'm always thinking about stuff but I thought about it from another angle and I thought about it we in our circumstances one of the most familiar things we do is when somebody does us wrong, our reaction is not lamb. Our reaction is this is unfair or this is unjust. This is unjust. And so, and this is just wrong and, and everything. And so like Peter, we would be saying to the people doing this, this is unfair and this is wrong and everything. Because that's, you know, you let that attitude go and that's what it'll look like. I mean, we may hold it down but a held down beast is still a beast. I mean, we have to admit that, it's still a beast. I mean, you know, there are mores and there are laws and ethics and all this stuff that keep our beasts from just devouring everybody, you know? Because we're, we're civilized people. Yeah, that's, I'm with you, brother. <laughs> you know, but but if there were no, no restraints, which means the law on that, then the beast would be unleashed. Release the kraken. But, but the law doesn't change you from a beast to a lamb. The law doesn't do that. The death of Christ does that. Amen? All right, so now I read, because we have to. <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you, I'm, I'm just loving what the Lord has been sharing with me in Revelation. And uh, I just, so that's why I do, more, I, I do as much reading as I can, because I don't want you to miss out on anything. I am telling you to see... You know, there was a window open, I mean, a door open in heaven, and a voice says, come up here. To see from that place where the Lamb is enthroned is incredible compared to the earth where we make our rules and our laws and our, you know, it's all made, it's all made according to us, the pattern of the old nature. That's what it's made according to, or the law, because there are a lot of laws on the books that are after the Ten Commandments and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> all right, the nature of the conflict. To have a conflict, there must be at least two opposing sides. Uh, and now I'm not going to read all the scripture references to these, but I got them here. And they have little red hearts beside them so that I know they're dear to Jesus' heart and his meaning. <clears throat> then, um, to have a conflict, there must be at least two opposing sides. The opposition is led by a great red dragon. But, comma, a beast risen from the sea, comma, and a beast that rises from the earth. These are all in Revelation 12 and 13. <clears throat> they are committed together and they have, a, have powerful weapons. They have powerful rep weapons and resources at their disposal. Their opposition, um, their opposition is against a little slaughtered lamb and his followers who are in white robes, washed in his blood, and in their hands are the mighty weapons of 
palm leaves. Revelation 7, 9. This is the other side. Their appearance hardly sends shivers down the spine of the enemy. These followers have one strategy, to die, just as was Jesus' plan when he faced evil powers when he came to the earth. Amen? When he, that's what he did. See, but we, no, we're different now. <clears throat> um, as martyrs, when he, when he, Jesus, faced evil powers when he came to earth. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. Make sure. These followers have one strategy to die just, <clears throat> just as Jesus' plan when he faced evil powers when he came to earth. As martyrs, they will in their self-giving give testimony to the glorious nature of they um, give testimony to the glorious nature and extreme selflessness of the slaughtered lamb. And I have a ton of scriptures from the book of Revelation laid down here to show, from, from chapter 1 all the way to 19, to show that this is the testimony that we're supposed to have. <clears throat> we are to be a living testimony to others of this slaughtered lamb. We reflect the one on the throne. That's the testimony. All right. What we discover is what might be expected from the outcome of the clash. The lamb's followers are soundly defeated by greater forces and they are put to death. And there's several scriptures on that. In like manner as Jesus, this too becomes the avenue by which the victory is gained through laying down their life. To them going into suffering and death by Christ crucified. Notice, notice this is not about just going into suffering and death. It is not. It is not. There's no virtue in suffering. There's no virtue in death. There's only virtue in the Lamb who gives himself unto death or who suffers for others and lives in us. There's only virtue because he's the only one that's selfless. <clears throat> totally, truly. Um, to them, going into suffering and death by Christ crucified is the very nature of the victory. Now, we can hear all this and we can go, hey, amen, yeah, yeah, yeah. The question isn't do we believe this doctrinally? Because if, because... The truth is we don't even believe it doctrinally if it, if it can't be manifested through us in the crisis. If we're in the crisis and we can't recognize who the beast is in this, and it could be us, because <laughs> we're reacting and we're going, well, they, they're wrong. They're the ones who should suffer, not me. So all this stuff, that's beast. That's beast. That's the law. That's somebody taking the law and saying, we live by this. And I'll stand before God based on this. Good luck. Good luck. But guess what? If you're flouting that in the, in the situations where you should have life, then that's what you're going to face. You reap what you sow. You know, mercy will be granted to those that show mercy. <clears throat> If they can pass through these trials in the same spirit and nature of self-giving that Jesus did, they will have overcome. That's how you overcome. In the same spirit and manner in which Jesus overcame. I think I've got it written. However, if they fight back, resi uh, fight back, resist, and take a stance to seek to save themselves, they will have fallen short of God's definition of overcoming because they manifested another image than his own, see. And uh, somewhere in here, I'll, sh I'll use that word overcoming. It may be much later, but I'll show it in relationship to Jesus and therefore to us. <clears throat> in Jesus' defeat, we Let me go back to that last statement. However, if they fight back, resist, and take a stance to seek to save themselves, Jesus said, if you seek to save, you lose. You go, no, uh, when I seek to save, 
I beat them down or I, you know, I make them look bad. I don't lose. No, maybe you don't lose in the world, but you lose before the lamb. He's the one that's sitting on the throne. You lose before him. And see, the problem is, <clears throat> the problem is we're not really, we are not really in a mindset <clears throat> that Jesus right now is the Lamb of God, identified as the Lamb of God, is that spirit on the throne that God exalted, and that everything we do will be measured by that. We, we think that doctrinally, but it's not even doctrinally. Because if it's truly doctrine according to the way the scripture is, it is, it is truth. But it, if we disagree with it in our heads when the subject is brought up in a religious setting where there is no um, <clears throat> conflict, then um, we're fine. But if we're put into another situation what we are in the crisis will show up, what we are. All right, so if that's true, let me take a drink before I finish that sentence. If that's true, then, and we, we know that that's true of us, we should give due diligence and complete attention to, this, to, to, to having him revealed in us, lest we're one of those that's divided and the, the sheep go over here and the goats go over there, or the lambs go over here and the beasts go over there. However you want to look at it, <clears throat> it is not his image. It's not his image. Um, so. I'm partially saying that to scare you, but I'm really saying that more in hopes that it won't be an issue of where, if judgment and where we'll be divided out and everything, that more than that, greater than that, it'll be an issue of, oh Jesus, I want that spirit, your spirit, your nature, your image, built into me. I want to be conformed to that and I want to do that because then, you know, because we're talking right now Revelation 12, 10 chapters later, <clears throat> then I will be after your kind. I will be bride. I will be the wife of the Lamb. I will be one that can partner with you in union, uh, in oneness, and you can, you know, you can rest in me. You're not always having to deal with that. And you remember the, what is it, the virtuous woman in um, Proverbs, the last chapter 31, I think it is, and his heart re greatly rests in her. That's the virtuous woman. Well, the rest comes, see, if there's, if you're dealing with two different ways and people and things and stuff, you're always having to go, well, well, my way is to do this. Well, my way is this. And, well, I say th do this, da, 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 da. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's just constant conflict. Can you believe that there are actual marriages that are like that? <laughs> I looked at Deb just as she looks up. <laughs> you know, there are. Where, the, where it's, it's just not there, okay, what's the answer? Well, the man says you must conform to me. Well, the woman says you need to conform to Jesus. Well, you both, we all do, amen? My God, let's quit trying to shape one another up and let's go after Jesus with all of our heart. I mean, do we love him or not? Is, is he the desire of our heart? We say, I love you, Jesus. Is he the desire of your heart? Yeah, when, uh, when I die. But then he's not the desire of your heart. You just don't want to go to hell. But, but do, things challenge, do things challenge your spirit, your reactions? We all have reactions. Do things challenge that where we look and we go, that, that in me is not him. And I am not okay with it. I mean... Until that becomes the case, 
there's not going to be any conformity. I mean, it starts truly with a desire after him and a desire for a, a change. But not just change for the sake of change. I want to change. No, it's not I want to change. I want to be conformed to his image. See, that is change, but we just say I want to be changed. I want to be a better person. A better person. If you were the best person ever and not conformed to the image of Christ, you're still not what he wants. And you're still in conflict with him. Okay. So, <clears throat> what are we saying? Well, we're not talking about getting to fear about, you know, oh no, or this or that, or all that stuff. We're just saying just love Jesus. Love him. Go after him. Let, let him be your contrast. And then when you're in contrast to him, then cry out to him because he's, he is the change. He's not just the changer. He is the change. He is the change. <clears throat> All right. Glad I went back. In Jesus' defeat, we find the very core reality of God's essence. What? In Jesus' defeat, we find the very core reality of God, his essence. We find lamb. We find dove. We find selflessness. We find, um, we find not beast. And here's the interesting thing. Um, this is not the place to put this, but I am hoping we get to it. Because throughout the book of Revelation is judgments and fire and death and stuff coming down and bad things happening and you go well where do you, what do you how do you reconcile the lamb with all of that stuff all the judges you got the seals you got the the, the I, I'm sorry my mind went to walruses I don't know <clears throat> anyway <clears throat> And, and it just locked up there for them. The seals, the trumpets, and the vials or bowls, however, whatever translation you have. Well, there is reconciliation into that, and I hope to get into it when we get into chapter 6, where we start dealing with the seals and we find... We find an amazing explanation of something we thought was meant for something else. Just judgment. Judgment on the earth. That's all God's interested in. No. My God, no. All right. For everyone who lays himself into Jesus' death, out of it comes forth the very energy for more life. Paul made it plain that God's power is not found in strength but weakness. And I have several scriptures with little red hearts beside those two. What is weakness? It is that of taking us out of confidence. Because confidence is strength, isn't it? What is weakness? It is that of taking us out of confidence and stability, thereby making us not feel adequate, not feel informed or in control in ourselves. Now, that doesn't sound good to most Christians. Most Christians are seeking for those very things. I want strength. I, oh, Lord, strengthen me. And that's what we're shooting for all the time. We want to be better, stronger, faster. Sorry, I watched too many commercials or something. I don't know. <clears throat> it is making us not feel adequate. Because why? We're, because we're going to find our adequacy in the Lamb. Okay? Not feel confidence. Not feel stability in ourselves. There's tremendous confidence and stability in his nature. I don't know that there's confidence and stability in, in the teaching about his nature. I think that can shake you up. It did me which was part of the deal. That's what it was meant to do. 
shake me down so that I, I would, what did I say in the sentence before? Uh, um, for everyone who lays himself into Jesus' death, lays himself. That's water baptism. I'm just laying myself into Jesus' death. When I come up, I don't come up. You know, it's just beautiful. But see, imagine if every time you baptize somebody, you lay them back and they go, <laughs> flailing and <laughs> we go, you know, shouldn't we pick another ritual or something? Well, guess what? How many of those people that lay back, that can lay back and trust that, you know, they're, they're not going to go floating down the river or something like, like we did in Ireland. And, you know, we almost lost one. <laughs> Goodbye, Alistair. Go get him. <clears throat> um, but, but, you know, most lay back and just get baptized and come back up. But how many of those at that point say, I'm gonna start laying myself into Jesus' death like I did in, in a symbolic way through water baptism. How many people, you know, no, we don't do that. We, we go, I, I got baptized in water. It's almost like, you know, good for you. Now you're dead and Jesus is your life. You gonna live like it? No, no, I'm just gonna be a happy Christian. You know, <clears throat> I know, I, you know, I know, I'm a terrible man and pastor, but it's still the truth, <laughs> my God. Okay, the end result of that is that we thrust our total confidence in God's method of strength as seen in weakness and trust that life comes out of death carried out in the nature of the Lamb of God. So, you know, most of the time, we, what we cry out to God for in relationship to us is when we see something that's short of that. We'll, maybe we'll even do it in what I talked about earlier. We'll do it in relationship to seeing beast in me instead of lamb. But the death is complete. It's, it, it, it cuts. Jesus lays the ax to the root of the tree. What's the tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not just your evil, but your good. He takes it out. He takes you down. I'm going to take you down to Chinatown. Bless you. That's your, I'm sure your mom recognizes that sneeze. <clears throat> On the other side of this conflict, we find that beasts use power and strength to overcome. But when they do so, they open up the door for slain saints to enter through the 12 gates into New Jerusalem and become built into being Lamb's wife. Should I read it again? Oh my God, that's a four line sentence. <laughs> no wonder you wanted me to read it again. On the other side of this conflict, we find that beasts use power and strength to overcome, but when they do so, they open up the door for slain saints to enter through the 12 gates into New Jerusalem and become built into being Lamb's wife. See, we go, this isn't right. This is more than, it's better than right or wrong. This is the door. This is the way into conforming to his wife. Or it can be the way to show that we're still beasts. Amen? The unjustness of what people do. <clears throat> This defeat, and I've got it in parentheses, this defeat by the enemy is the true medium of God's victory in us. It's not a victory in the situation, except for maybe what, what looks like a victory for the enemy. But it is God's victory in us. It is the Lamb's victory in us. And he rejoices. He rejoices. Not just because he won some victory, He's, he's so not the way 
We think he is. It's a victory because he's gained one more step in this bride that's going to be one after his kind, the, the lamb's wife. How, how lovely is that? There is no greater victory that lies ahead. This is the great finale. That's why it's in the book of Revelation. This is the great finale. When Jesus says it's finished, that was the great finale. And in the book of Revelation, it is our great finale. It is there that the Lamb is firmly enthroned in us. Because see, we go, oh, oh yes, one day, one day, you know, in the sweet by and by, we're gonna, we're gonna be the new Jerusalem. It's the bride, the wife of the lamb, and he's going to shine out of us. He's going to be enthroned in us. He wants that now. He wants to be enthroned as by his nature in us now. Okay? So I said, this is the great finale. It is there that the lamb is firmly enthroned in us. He is firmly enthroned in us when we get in those situations and instead of seeking to save. And usually the way, one, way, one added thing to seeking to save is we seek to put the other person down lower than us so that we look better than they do. See, that's seeking to save. You know. And those things are so ugly, but I just, you know, I don't like talking about them. It is the greatest victory, for it is his victory over us, and not merely our victory over beasts. Yes. It's his victory over us, and not merely our victory over beasts. It is in these latter stages that God wipes away all tears. Before this, there was suffering and weeping, even in heaven, right? Revelation 5, there was weeping in heaven. No more. See, we go, well, when we get to heaven, there's going to be no more tears. The Bible says that. So as so soon as John's caught up, <laughs> everybody's weeping, going, who's able to open the book? You know? But, folks, the weeping goes all the way through until you have manifested the lamb nature and then there's no, I mean once he sees that you conform to that there's no more need for stuff like that he'll wipe away all your tears you know what I mean there's no more need for proving or testing or whatever you'll just be one <clears throat> in several places in the book there is the promise of no more tears that will come once followers of the Lamb have passed through the trials as overcomers and they are established as part of the bride of the Lamb. Only when she is conformed will there be no more need for affliction to work for us. This light affliction worketh for us. Then there is no more death after this manner. No more tears. No more death after this manner. All right. So we see if we see that we see that there is a clear cut path, a clear-cut path. Uh, Revelation has it. Uh, you could call it, uh, I don't know, maybe like an ancient path or something. It is it, It's so funny because there's a path to salvation, but once you meet Jesus, there's an eternal plan. And that one relates to, to him, not us. Salvation relates to what he did for us. But once you get on this path, it relates to what we do for him. And it, not, not by works, not by law, but by nature, by, by embracing that spirit, embracing his spirit. See, I mean, there's several ways to look at it. We can say, oh, the, the lamb nature is beautiful, which I agree with. I personally believe that with all my heart. And I, as far as I can say, with all my heart. But it's his nature. 
It's Jesus' nature. It's him. It is him. It is him. It's not just something external to him. It is him. This is you. This is... So I would do this for you. You know, I would not, well, I'll do this because I want to conform to the image of the lamb. Or I'll do this because I believe the lamb nature is beautiful. That's fine. As long as you understand that the lamb nature is, it's just him. It's him. I mean, we say we love Jesus. Then show it, but show it by wanting that to come out of you, to... But, but before it'll ever come out of you, it has to be established in you. And establishment is, means there's going to be failures. You'll react. You'll this and that, da 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 But you have to get on the plan. You know what I mean? You have to get on the plan. If you're not on the plan, then you just react, and then one time you do good, luck, lucked out or something. You know what I mean? And, and, but it's no, there's no plan. You haven't got on the plan. <clears throat> How am I doing here? Ooh, I'm so proud. <laughs> We're making good progress. Most Christians connect Jesus' victory to be a victory over the devil. Most Christians connect Jesus' victory to be a victory over the devil. <clears throat> Certainly, the Bible declares that Jesus gained victory over Satan. But, and here's the but, but how do we view that victory? How do we view that victory? Do we see it as Jesus conquering Satan? You know, there was a song back uh, during the charismatic movement, <clears throat> And, and uh, at the latter part of the charismatic movement, uh, there was a lot of um, militant type teaching, like almost army and stuff like that. And one of my favorite songs was called Mighty Warriors. Mighty Warriors dressed for battle. Holy Lord of all is he. Commander in chief, bring us to attention. We are set to battle to crush the enemy. Okay. I like that song. I, like, I particularly like the chord progression. <laughs> I do. I always like it. I haven't been able to do it since then. <clears throat> but in reality, the true nature of the battle was Jesus going to a cross and dying, not crushing the enemy in the traditional sense not being, you know, um, what was the, there, there used to be a, a group and, oh yeah, uh, I don't remember the name of the group, but the, their slogan was armed and dangerous. <laughs> okay, so, and they had like grenades going across here, and this is a picture of, the, of their logo or something like that, and a, and a uh, AR-15 <coughs> weapon. And so, uh, so there was, there was this militancy, and it was all about us being stronger than the devil, and us being uh, um, like s s really s elite soldiers. <clears throat> So that's why I wrote here, but how do we view that victory? Do we see it as Jesus conquering Satan? If we do, then conquering must be clearly understood and defined. It is obvious that the enemy was a main player in Jesus' death, right? It was Satan in Judas that set up Jesus' betrayal that led to his crucifixion, John 13, 27. By all outward appearances, the devil did conquer Jesus. I mean, you can't deny that. You cannot deny that. At no point did Jesus take up arms and strike back. Hmm. 
That me if that never happened at any point, that means that, that it, whether we understand it or not, somewhere in that death, there was a different kind of power, and that power in that death defeated the enemy. Hebrews 2.14, that through death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Through death. I had to get rid of the old man. The old man is crucified with Christ. Well, how did he, he deal with the law? The law is dead with him. Well, how do you get rid of You go right down the line of every enemy, and I can show you a scripture that literally says it's dead with Christ, that Jesus dealt with it by death. All right. What's the point? What's the point of arguing? Uh, <clears throat> no argument. The truth is that we either see this thing through eyes that can lead us to be a beast. We're going to be. A, we're going to crush the enemy. And if the devil's the enemy, we'll crush him. And if our brother's the enemy, we'll crush him. Do you see how that can play out? We're not beasts. We're sent forth as lambs for the slaughter. That's what it says in Romans 8. The Lord's victory was not seen in overcoming death as some suppose. It was literally by death. He didn't, Jesus didn't go, death you're a bad thing. I'm going to strangle you. Yeah. He didn't conquer death. Not in the, as I said, traditional sense. It was, let's see. It was literally by death that he won. There is a difference between overcoming death. Listen to this. Overcoming death. There's a difference between overcoming death and letting death overcome you. Now Jesus, we do realize Jesus died, right? <laughs> he died. And in that sense, because you see, if he had a fought death, which he never did. Uh, don't you know, Pilate said to him, don't you know I have power to, to save your life or to take it? And Jesus doesn't look worried. He's not, see, this, things are not out of control for the lamb. They're out of control to us. Jesus is not worried. He says, he's, he's He's tied up. He's been beaten and everything else. And he says, you have no power at all except it be given to you of God. Well, how do you fight that? How do you fight that? If, if it won't lash back, I'll protect myself. Well, the only reason why you protect yourself is that you, to you, death is still an enemy. To God... Death is his means of bringing about certain things. Death is your enemy if you have a different nature. If you have a different, then it's your enemy. Because you don't want to die. But to Jesus, because he dies in a certain spirit and nature, it can't hold him. He'll have to come up. That's, the, that's just the nature of it, of, his, of him and in dying in the manner in which he dies. And of course, all of this dying we're talking about, we're not just talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual realities more than, more than physical death. <clears throat> There's a difference between overcoming death and letting death overcome you. Any overcoming that Jesus may have accomplished over the enemy or over death was strictly in light of his, de his defeat at the cross quote-unquote defeat, quote-unquote defeat. Okay, so that means if we're defining things, that means that God would define laying down our life as a victory, not a defeat. 
Why would he do that? I mean, why would he do that? Why would God look at it like that? Because uh, you find this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because there's a, there is another kind of power that people of this earth, beasts of this earth, that people that have a fallen nature know nothing of, and that their self-survival instinct and their, you know, I want to live attitude makes them weary, wary, sorry, wary of that. So you should never be shocked at anybody if you're talking to them about Christ crucified and they go, I don't think so. Because in that old nature, they have every right to because their thought of death is different than Jesus' thought of death. That's just it. That's no way to get around it. There's no way to get around it. That's one reason why at Mardi Gras, the track that, that, uh, that I wrote with that, that girl was so effective dealing with suicide. And so many people took it. You, some of you may not realize, in all of the tracks that we set out over the years, the most taken track was a suicide track. And we got more responses back from people either calling or writing to us from that than any other track. On any outreach. Okay, so why is that? Because People that, want, that truly want to commit suicide want to die. They're not afraid of death. They want to die. I mean, you know, there is some fear, but I'm just saying, basically, they have less fear than most people because they'll attempt it and, and do it. But in the track, I start off, so you want to die. Well, that's good because that's exactly what you need, see? And the cross is the answer, see? So you, you slowly bring them in. And when, when I got through, I was writing this with a, with a girl who was uh, one of the students or whatever, and she was, she was uh, hardcore wanting to commit suicide. And, and when I sat down to talk with her about it, everything that the average Christian person would say is, does not help at all. Doesn't help. They're, they come from a. So when I realized that, I went, you know what? I need you to help me to write something. She goes, what? I said, yeah, we're going to sit down. We're going to spend time. We're going to figure this thing out. She said, okay. I said, I can't do it without you. Okay. Because I couldn't. <laughs> I don't think like that, you know? And so I said, when I say this, what do you think? She says, I think you're an idiot because this doesn't jive with somebody who's thinking suicide. I said, okay, I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> and I said, so, so we talked through and we spent hours and actually over several days and we finally finished that track and it says, so you want to die, you need to die because that's what they believe. That's why they want it, that's why they would commit suicide. They need to die, they should die. And you go, well, that's right, you sure should. The only problem is, you're talking about the wrong kind of death. You get it to that point. And then you start pointing to the answer, which is Christ crucified, another person who died. And you bring them into the spirit of this thing and not, the, not you're not trying to bring them into Christianity. You're trying to bring them into a reality that is true and if all Christians would realize it, we would all embrace the cross in a different way. Any overcoming that Jesus may have accomplished over the enemy or over death was strictly in light of his defeat at the cross. <clears throat> Colossians 2.15 tells us that God disarmed the principalities and powers, making a public spectacle of them by triumphing over them in the cross. <laughs> it was in the death that he did that. Again, Hebrews 2.14, which I already said, um, confirms that reality as well as does John 
th uh, 31. So you have John 12, 24, and you have Jesus saying, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And then he says immediately after, if anyone's gonna follow me, then follow me in this spirit. Follow me and trust, trust death. And then he says, now is the prince of this world cast down. Now when? Right this minute? Right now? You haven't died? Now what? What are you, what are you saying? See? And we don't, we just go, well, yeah, now because Jesus is about to defeat the enemy or whatever. No. He's just said, a seed must fall into the ground and die. This is my, this is God's mind. This is the principle of death. And if anybody follows me, the him will my father honor, and this is the way you follow me. And then he says, now, if we're going to do this, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to die on the cross. Are you going to be with me? Now is the prince of this world cast down. As we all enter into this, this spirit, this lamb spirit. Both speak of his victory, yet both emphasize the cross as the tool. Sorry to take the moment, but I think I'm going to stop right here. Okay, let's take a break.